The haunting legends of a mighty Bigfoot have made man's blood run cold for centuries, some terrific and some terrifying. The Southern Appalachian Mountains whisper the mysteries of this strange and powerful creature through its smoky hills and ominous embrace. This is Brandon Thomas with Expanding Reality, elated to announce our very first Expanding Reality Excursions Befriending Bigfoot event. This is going to take place on a beautiful 27-acre ranch in Blairsville, Georgia, May 15th through the 20th. This intimate conference is going to feature Bigfoot adventure hikes in three different states, river kayaking, nightly presentations from such incredible presenters as Alexander Petikoff, Chris Matthew, Dave Zed, Preston Dennett, and many more. Also, we're going to be doing some UFO watching, some jam sessions, all kinds of hangouts. Visit expandingrealitypodcast.com slash events for more information. That's expandingrealitypodcast.com slash events. We'll see you there. A choice right now, right now, between fear and love. It's just a rock. Out of the dark night of ignorance and into the shining light of truth. Expounding reality. A population of citizens capable of critical thinking. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. There's a, a level of reality where everything dissolves into a, an ocean of energy. We empower our experience by insisting on our authenticity. That's very profound. Very Expanding, Expanding reality. Welcome to Expanding Reality. I am your host, Brandon Thomas. On this incredibly cool episode, Chris Evers from Outer Limits Magazine joins us with our creative expansion artist, Polymath Jenny, creating some incredible art along with this conversation. So if you're interested in that, check the video version of this show linked down in the description, and you can follow along with this kinetic learning experience and enjoyability that Polymath Jenny is in inviting us to participate in here. So all the ways to find both folks uh, will be located down in the show description. Down there as well, would like to point your attention to the link that reads Expanding Reality Podcast. Dot com so we can find all things us but more importantly you can find our new event that we are having may 15th through the 20th in blairsville georgia this is our befriending bigfoot event it's going off we've got trey hudson preston dennett dave zed tons of people out there alexander petikoff chris matthew all kinds of folks guys so definitely check down there on how to join us for that and we are very much looking forward to seeing you more on that later but for now and without any further ado chris evers Chris Evers, welcome to the show, my friend. Uh, you and I have officially two hundred or seven hundred rather and twenty six mutual Facebook friends. Did you know that that you and I had that absolutely many? no idea? And thank you very very much for the welcome. Yeah, man, it's cool to see you. Uh, we're going to talk about all the amazing things that you do, of course. Uh, Outer Limits Magazine, OLMMag.co.uk will be linked down below, as well as all of the other ways to find you, my friend. I want to let everybody know ahead of time as well that we do have our creative expansion art series expanding all the time, and Polymath Jenny is here to create live art along with us. So check the show description for the video version of this so that you can follow along for all of our kinetic learners that enjoy something so amazing. And check Jenny's workout. I'll be posting her Instagram down there. That is a filter system, so you got to be cool to get in. But definitely give her a follow if you'd like to, and join us along uh, the video version to see this amazing piece of art being created live with this awesome dude here talking about really, really cool stuff. So Chris Evers, it's cool to see you, dude. Um, again, thank you so much for joining me. And if you don't mind, just beyond what I said there, I'm, I know there's tons to offer here, but if you don't mind introducing yourself for the audience in your own words, brother. Okay, um, my name is Chris Evers. I've been interested in the subject of UFOs. UAPs, or let's go really old school, flying saucers, yeah. for quite a number of years. And um, really since my first sighting that I had personally way, way back when I was a, a young dinosaur. And uh, that was way back in 1974. And uh, from there, I've uh, developed a keen interest in the subject. I've, I've read 
many, many books. I, I started way back in 1974 with publications by uh, Major Donald Kehoe and, and others, you know, the gentleman from NICAP. And uh, I've uh, progressed through the years. I was an investigator for uh, Quest International, which was a group in, in the United Kingdom run by a former a British uh, police sergeant by the name of Tony Dodd, who also worked alongside of a gentleman that people may remember. If you, uh, it's, if you remember the old British version of UFO magazine, which was uh, published by Mark Bertel and his brother, Graham Bertel. Graham, unfortunately, passed away round about, tw- well, it was actually 20 years ago last year. And uh, so I've, I've worked for those guys. I've uh, run UFO groups. I've done sky watches. I've, I've run conferences. I've public- published paper-based uh, items that have gone around the world. And I'm currently the editor of Outer Limits magazine, OLM, uh, as it's now known known as, which uh, is now coming up to issue 50, slowly but surely. So that'll be in the June uh, issue of, of uh, 50, with the 50th issue in June. And, um, you know, it's a subscription only publication, approximately 90 to 100 pages every two months. And the big one, the 50th, is going to be hopefully a bumper 150 page publication. So people might have something to read that's interesting in that. And as I always say, be informed and make sure of all things as the scripture says in the Bible. Man, I love this, Chris. You're so great, dude. I, I love what you're doing. Your Outer Limits magazine is a fantastic publication. It's just a, a paramount cornerstone of the phenomena. I mean, you you have such a wide variety of perspectives in there and insights and you just offer such an amazing array of articles and information and ways of looking at the phenomenon and introducing cases and information and events and things like that it's just brilliant brother absolutely brilliant yeah we have a lot of um a lot of people who contribute to that it's not just you know a one man show as it were yes i'm the editor but i have an associate editor by the name of malcolm robinson who is like myself he's been involved in the subject quite a number of years he's based up in scotland a couple of hundred miles away from where i am right now good old philip mantle uh, as we all know he's the editor sorry the owner of flying Dispress. he has been the editor of several um publications in the past but basically paper based he's a regular contributor and not only that he's also the publisher of my first novel um not novel sorry <laughs> first book on the subject of uh, the phenomena and um you know so there are a lot of people from MUFON who get involved, L. Gray Anderson, I have people like Peter Robbins, you know, in the conferences that I've run, I've had people over like uh, Colonel Hall of the, the Rendlesham incident. We've had Mary Rodwell from Australia, you know, former British nurse, Mary Rodwell. And we have a plethora of British, you know, researchers and investigators. And the idea behind it all is to get the information out and it's the same idea with, with, with the magazine. Get the information out to the people, leave it for them to make their own minds up. Although I do occasionally have opinions on things and I will put something in there about something that has recently happened on one of the old old time cases, you know, and, and just make it interesting for people. Be informed. Absolutely. And that's one of the things is ask questions, be informed, just look around at what's going on. Here's some presented information that you're not going to find in the mainstream media, you know, and that's that's the whole point about this is it's the outer limits, which is where we find ourselves and our minds and our imaginations constantly. Some people physically or at least they feel that they've gone there with their contact experiences and all of these other things. So a lot of folks live in the outer limits and you provide a great home for those people, man, and contributors as well. So I'd like to talk about, before your books are, uh, your 74 sighting, if you don't mind. Let's hear about that. Okie dokie. Um, this was a, a February evening in uh, the winter of 1974. We'd, we'd had the new year. We'd uh, basically, it was, it was an early February event. I can't remember the exact date. It is 50 years ago this month. And um, uh, we'd come home from school, myself and my younger brother, I'd come home from, it was a senior high school, which, which I was in. That was for ages 12 to 16 at the time. We would class that as a senior high school. I come home from school. We'd had our evening meal. It was already dark and we were lucky enough 
you know, my mum would let us out. My mum, we was a one parent family. My mum did everything for us and uh, bless her heart. You know, she's no longer with us and I wouldn't be the person that I am today without her, to be quite honest. But anyway, we'd come home from school. We'd had our evening meal. We'd ask if we could go meet up with a couple of friends for, for an hour. And um, this was round about 4 p.m. in the afternoon, the very early evening. But as you know, in winter in Great Britain at that time, it's already dark. And um, we decided to have a game of war, believe it or not. We weren't allowed, you know, we, we didn't have things like um, laptops. You know, we, we were looking if we had a push bike and a stick. Well, the push bike came along a little bit later. So I was lucky enough to have a stick. So we decided to play war. And back in the 1970s, there was no laws or restrictions on building sites. Now, we lived on a brand new housing estate in the Kingston upon Hull or Hull, as we call it, H-U-L-L, -L, um, in the city here in East Yorkshire, which is just near the North Sea. It's where the um, the Umber Bridge was built, which at one time was the longest single-span suspension bridge in the world. Now, the Humber Bridge is quite important in this, in that while we were playing war, I was hiding away. We'd split into two roughly equal teams, and I was hiding away on top of a mound of mud, which we've been extremely lucky the last week or so. We'd had um, no rain, we'd had no snow or anything like that. Uh, so it was all dry and we're adding a way up there and I'm looking out and I'm looking across the city to where they just more or less started the Humber Bridge and I see a pink prick of light. Didn't think anything to it, carried on watching, went off, you know, one, one quick flash, gone. Went off, looked again, this time it flashed again, but nearer to me. Hmm, that's interesting. Caught my attention, watched it a little bit, and then it, it kind of went, it jumped back on itself. And I thought, oh, that's a bit interesting. What's going on here? Blinked on at position one, blinked on at position three, then blinked on again at position two, and then at position four. And it leapfrogged across the sky, right to the position straight above my head. Now, as I'd already mentioned, we'd had no rain, no snow, no snow or anything like that for quite a while. And um, you could see a beautiful, beautiful vista of stars in the sky. On this new housing estate, there's no street lamps, no street lights or anything like that. So you could see all the night sky at that time in the evening, you know. And as it blinked out, sorry, I'll, re I'll repeat that. As it blinked above me, should I say, <laughs> it, it, I shouted to my friends, look, guys, there's a UFO in the sky. Now, the only reason I called it a UFO is because I wasn't slightly interested in thing, you know, science fiction, basically. Star Trek had just, you know, the original series had just started being shown in the United Kingdom round about that time or just a number of months earlier. And yeah, okay, it, I didn't imagine it as a UFO because I'd seen Star Trek. I called it a UFO because I'd watched a TV show, which was done by Jerry Anderson, the creator of Thunderbirds, Joe Nanty, uh, Captain Scarlet, uh, Stingray, all those kind of things. And he'd, he'd done a new show, which had live uh, p people, actors in it. And the show was called UFO. And that was about P uh, the aliens coming to Earth. Now, remember, this is the early 1970s. The actual, uh, com you know, the old thing about the show was aliens coming to Earth to take body parts to make the aliens on their planet better. Now, that's quite interesting when you think about that time and day, you know, because these kind of things seem to be happening nowadays. Anyway. I simply called it a UFO because I'd seen that television program. But as I shouted to my friends, look, guys, a UFO in the sky, it blinked out and did not appear in the sequence again that it should have done. The Humber Bridge, where it started, was southwest of my position. So it was traveling in a southwest to northeast direction. It w if it had carried on from where I'd seen it, it would have carried on moving northeast, but it didn't. It would have eventually have gone 
of the Holderness coastline. Holderness is, is an area, a county, a section of the county of East Yorkshire in, in the England area. And uh, it would have carried on and maybe heading up the coast to like Bridlington, Flamborough Head, which of course nowadays is made famous by investigators like Paul Sinclair, who's had many, many strange activities and things going on in the in the Flamborough and Bempton area. You know, so anyway, that, that was my first actual sighting. After I saw that, as I say, I started reading books by well, whichever books I could get my hands on, in all honesty. Thankfully, we had a lending library because a boy of 14 back in those days, who do you go to and report your sighting to? If it had gone to the police, it would have been put in a drawer, maybe ended up at the MOD, Ministry of Defence here in Britain, but it, it would have been ignored. Not, nothing would have come of it. So I kept it to myself, tried to read and find answers to the sighting that I'd had. And now... 50 years later, I'm still reading and I'm still looking for answers to the sighting that I had in 1974. Is that the only sighting you've had? No, it isn't. No. Um, as I said a few moments ago, I actually started uh, some gr groups up in the, in the whole area. And we, we used to run the whole UFO society. Now, this was down during the... Uh, mid 1990s and anyway we decided to have a sky watch one evening it was the middle of summer and we'd gone down to the back of the british aerospace factory where they made parts for british fighter jets you know and um some that they exported away to arabia uh, you know saudi arabia and so on and so forth anyway we're there this little UFO group, three people. Of course, we took all the gear, you know, video cameras, still cameras, sound equipment, so we could capture any noises that we heard or anything like that. We're there about an hour or so. It's getting a bit late, by this time, 11 p.m. in the evening. Let's move. Let's go somewhere else. Okay, so we packed all the gear away. And just as we packed it all away, would you believe it, what I can only describe as an orb-like thing actually uh, came, it appeared on the opposite bank of the River Humber. The British Aerospace Factory was about 10 yards away from the northern bank of the River Humber. And there's a public footpath that runs between the aerospace factory and the, and the river. It's not actually a river, it's an estuary, to be honest. But you know, anyway, this footpath is where we were. And on the opposite bank, on the southern bank, there's a hill that comes down and it eventually it glides down to the river. And, you know, it, it the hill comes down to the river and this light followed the, the, the contour of the hill. It came about a third of the way onto the river. And I'm stood there thinking, you know, put my chin back up and um, I'm watching it and I'm watching it go to my right, which is, is that way it, where I'm sat right now, watching it, watching it travel down the bank, uh, uh, um, up, you know, the opposite bank near the river and it's going down. And there's a little place down there called Reed Island, which is, it's a mud flat basically with a bit of grass on it, but they, they allow sheep on it. And apparently there, there are deer on there as well. Anyway, I'm watching it. It got to about Reed Island, which is about a mile, maybe a mile and a half away from where I was standing, and it blinked out. Oh, it's gone. Turned to my two friends, and I said to them, oh, it's gone. And Jason, uh, who was with me, a gentleman by the name of Jason Lewis, he turned around and he said, no, it hasn't. It's going under the Humber Bridge, which was to my left, the opposite direction. So it actually come down come across the river, split into two and gone in two different directions. So that was my second sighting. And I've had a couple of, um, we say like spooky things occur to me as well, but you know, that's a, a different story. <laughs> well, maybe what are the spooky things? How would, um, oh, okay. what happened there? The uh, first spooky thing, um, was myself, my wife and the two stepchildren were walking down a road. The road, the footpath was approximately 10 feet wide at this point, and we're going past an old school, which was on this road. We'd been to a friend's house. We're on our way back home. Now, on my right-hand side, where the school was, was a fence, which was roughly about shoulder height. At the back of the fence, you know, it was a metal fence, and the back of the fence was... um 
a privy edge, which, you know, one of those you can cut with garden shears, that kind of thing. And it, this was approximately two foot wide. Anyway, walking along, we're all talking away, just ignoring ourselves, igno ignoring what was going on, you know, just being ourselves. And um, all of a sudden, something grabbed my right shoulder and pulled me back. It, but it was with such force, it spun me round. And I spun round, and of course, I'm wondering what the, the heck is going on, you know, to be polite about it. So I'm getting ready to hit somebody. Oh, the hell are you? You know, what's going on? I turned round and there was nobody stood there. There was nobody behind the fence. And if there was somebody behind the fence, they'd have had to have a good reach because I was about a foot and a half, maybe two foot away from the fence on my right hand side. So whatever it was actually pulled me back. So that was a bit spooky, but unexplained. Now, as I mentioned earlier, my mum has passed away. She passed away in uh, December 2004. It was a few weeks just before Christmas. And uh, unfortunately, it was it was cancer that got her. And, um, you know, as I said, mentioned earlier, she was a great mum. I couldn't have had a better mum to put it, you know, any other way. And to be absolutely polite about that. Uh, still miss today. Anyway, my brother, my wife and uh, my brother's partner at the time, we cleared the house before we handed the keys back to the local council because she was a single parent family. She'd looked after us from me being three years old. And by this time, you know, I was like 44. Anyway, she looked after us both with no help from anybody. And um, we cleared the house, made it as tidy as we possibly could. And I kept just a couple of things from the property just to remind myself of my mum. And one of those was a shaving mirror, which had been kept in a bathroom. Now, we uh, had the unfortunate uh, experience of, of burying my mum on the 20th of December, you know, that year 2004. And just to cheer ourselves up a little bit, myself and my wife, we're going to go out this new year, the, the same new year. And I decided to go up to the bathroom and decide to have a shave. And of course, I'm using my mum's mirror. So there I am in the bathroom. I look down to the mirror to start with the razor blade. And there's my mum looking back at me from the glass in the mirror. So it was like, oh, wow, mum, you know, and that was it. She kind of like looked at me, smiled in, in her own little way and then faded out. So I'm not a religious person. You know, I've had my fair share of religion over my life, but um, my mum was actually a Jehovah's Witness. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe in life after death un until what they call Armageddon comes and the resurrected to live on, on the earth. Anyway, that was crazy that I saw my mum's face in that mirror. And it actually gave me some a bit of an answer, really, to one or two questions that were going through my head. Nothing that I've never thought about before. So a couple of months later, my wife and I and the stepson and his girlfriend decided to go to a, a seance, an event, basically, that was being held in a place called Beverly, which is about seven miles away from where I'm sitting right now. It's to, to the north of where I'm sitting. And um, we go in there. And me, of course, being an investigator for Quest International, you know, UFOs and all that, I thought, I am not going to go in there and answer any questions, give them any cold readings or anything like that. I'm just going to sit there. And if they ask me anything or say anything, I'll respond, but I won't give any information, you know, anyway. We sat there, me and the wife in the front row, and the, the stepson and his girlfriend, his girlfriend are on the right there as well. And um, he's going round, this, this clairvoyant is going round and he's talking to people, oh, yeah, 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 and all the rest of it. Anyway, he turns to me and he goes, your mum wasn't a believer, was she? And I thought, well, I'm not going to say anything yes or no to that. So I just went, mm-hmm you know, hummed at him basically. And he just turned around to me and he said, well, she is now. So that, that's the couple of spooky things that have happened to me over, over, over my, um, well, my now 64 years on the planet, basically. You still got plenty of time, brother. And then some wild stuff, though, <laughs> man. Some wild stuff. Yeah, very, stuff. very, when you think about it.
the hedge is odd, you know, because you always, I, I don't know. I mean, now I, I just, it kind of validates what I think when I'm walking by a hedge that somebody's going to like reach out and grab you. You know, it's just this weird, I don't know. Does everybody have that? But you actually maybe didn't have that thought before. And now you're just like, well, shit, anytime somebody can grab me and spin me around. Yeah. Well, this is why I, I was like, yeah, I'm not going to swear, you know, but it was a swearing moment. You know, it's like, oh, the hell are you? Like, you know, what's going on here? And I literally got my left fist up. You know, uh -huh. as, I, as I spun round, nobody, absolutely nobody there. My wife turned around. I mean, it is a few years ago now, like 20 years ago. And um, what's up with you kind of thing? Like, you know, she looked at me and she said, what are you doing? And um, yeah, crazy, absolutely crazy. It is indeed. And then the thing with your mom and the mirror, I mean, mirrors already hold such bizarre stories. I mean, uh, about the being the mirror to the world, like that that's really the you and this is just the mirror version of you. And when you look mm. in the mirror, that's because the other version of you wanted to look in the mirror, not because you chose to. All these very yep. interesting things. And then it being a gateway to some other world, perhaps. Mm. Let me introduce an idea. And I just kind of want to, we won't spend time on it any more than you'd like to, but there's an idea out there that may validate that um, even though she was Jehovah's Witness, she got to experience an afterlife in that uh, that the apocalypse has already happened. Have you ever heard of this, that Jesus' thousand-year reign has already come and gone and that we're actually in post-tribulation world? Well, when you think about the tribulation, there were, there were signs that were given which are actually still ongoing at the moment. Um, I can't remember the scripture. I think it's in Matthew, you know, um, tribulation, signs of tribulation, wars, famines, hunger, uh, deaths, etc., etc. So all that is part of the what they call, well, what the JWs call the warning signs. You know that we must that must occur first before the great tribulation occurs. But I've never actually heard that said before. What you've just mentioned. So you know, I think there is still. I'm not a religious person at all. You know, uh, I just leave people to get on with it. I'm not going to oppose what they do. It's their choice. It's absolutely their choice. You know, if they want to believe in God, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that's entirely up to them. You know, but my own opinion is religion is a man-made faith. It's um, it's just like time. It's a man-made concept. Ooh, we're going to talk about time too, but I like what you <laughs> said there um, because it is um, it is interesting when you start to think about that. Maybe even that the Bible itself has been apprehended. And I uh, was on Tinfoil Hat and talked about this. There's a list of maybe, I don't know, 40 pieces of scripture where actually in the physical Bible it will say, you know, um, the devil has been the murderer from the beginning and um well I, devil yeah the term the, devil and and satan means slanderer and opposer yeah that's, and that's basically what yeah. the name means adversary exactly yeah, opposer yeah. adversary you know so but don't forget if god made everything he also made satan as well you know, and it's in, in, in that perspective as well, then one could say that even in the Bible scriptures, it says that Satan was handed earth and that really this is hell and that this is the hell realm that we experience. And then when you look at some interesting bits of history, which well, is his story, that they added I's and J's to numbers rather than ones. And so this thousand year insert in our history has just sort of been popped in there. And so yeah. it's fascinating when you start looking at stuff like that. Let's look at the word hell. The term hell actually comes from i believe it comes from a german word um or a scandinavian word i can't remember the exact country it comes from now but it's also their version of the term hades which is a greek word now hades is excuse the french it's a bastardization of the word gehenna and gehenna was the valley outside of the old walled city of Jerusalem in the Valley of Inom, I believe it was, which was where, believe it or not, the ancient Israelites, the ancient Hebrews who lived there at the time, you know, actually dumped all their rubbish and burnt it. So that is where the term hell comes from, has been a fiery, tormenting place. It's not, it doesn't exist. You know, if, if God is a man-made concept, then surely he's a poser, Satan, the devil, must also be a man-made concept. I love this. Yes. And you're absolutely right with this. And this is where we go with these ideas, man, is this idea of like, okay, well, if it's here, let's expand on it. And let's look at what this really means. And to validate what you just said, I'm just going to read real quick. Hell, Hades, Tartarus, and Hinnom. Uh, Tartarus, the first yeah. word. Yeah, the first word hell is de uh, derived from an Anglo-Saxon word, hellia, which is exactly what you just said, by the way. I'm just repeating yeah. what you just said. Germanic, basically. 
exact high German, uh, Hell Hella circa 725 AD, uh, that is used in the King James Version of the Bible to capture mm -hmm. the Jewish concept of Gehenna as the final desti destination of the wicked. Very interesting, my friend. So yeah, you it, see, the Israelites had no, they had no vision of hell. It, it was, it was, um, Oh, sorry. I'll, I'll repeat that. I'll, I'll, I'll say that again. They had no belief in in uh, an afterlife, you know, of, of an everlasting soul, which was tormented in hell. You know, the term soul, S O U L, it comes from an Hebrew word, ancient Hebrew word, gain of nephesh. Now, I'll give you an example. There's uh, an incident. In the Bible, and you can read it in any Bible, Catholic, JW, um, you know, Church of England, Protestant. Uh, the time Paul, who was Saul, is traveling to Malta in a boat. And obviously the, it's, it'll be a sailed boat, you know, or, or a rowing boat kind of thing. And they're traveling across the Mediterranean which obviously, you know, it's a landlocked sea, but it's quite a large landlocked sea, you know. So they're traveling from the, the ancient land of Israel, and they eventually are, are approaching, I believe it was Malta. I might be incorrect, but I believe it was Malta. And I believe that, that he's on the way to Rome at the time. Anyway, this storm comes up from absolutely nowhere. Now, in the Bible, it describes them, the, the passengers in that, boat and it it describes them as souls s-o-u-l-s -S. now if there were souls and so a soul is something that leaves your body when you die then they must all have already been dead in the boat whereas in reality whereas in reality it means people the term nephesh actually means a living breathing individual Check the word nephesh, N-E-P-H-E-S-H. The Hebrew view, the Hebrew word for soul is nephesh, and it literally means breath. So you, you are a soul because you breathe. You know, and this goes to the Anunnaki. It, well, it, it, this is in here, uh, animals as well as humans being created with this life breath as a gift from yeah. God. So it's almost as if you were imbued with it from the clay yeah. of the earth and then breath of God. That's See, fascinating. Adam, Adam, which means ruddy or, or earth-like, actually, you know, he, he didn't become a living soul until he had the breath of life breathed into him. At home, of course, A T O M, you know, could be a very literal, you know, thing there, and I think it's fascinating. Um, there was this, like I said, uh, so I I uh, had this list of scripture, and what's fascinating about it was it's just that the the murder count in the Bible. Have you ever gone through and done that, seen how many murders? No, are I in haven't. The Bible? No, actually, no, no. Okay, not at check all. this out. So John eight forty four reads, "The devil is the murderer from the beginning." Never, rem never forget that. Okay, the devil is the mur or adversary, basically not God. Okay. Now uh, there is a list of murders that go on throughout the Bible, but if you tally all of those up, they end up somewhere around God in the Bible. God murders, I think, two point four million people somewhere in there. When you add up all the dead babies from um, uh, Egypt and stuff like that. So it's fine. We killed 10,000 babies. Right. And so, uh, if you look then at, hang on. Okay. At revelation 12, nine dash 11. Now I'll ask you how many, um, kill, what's the kill count for the devil in the Bible? Do you think just rough estimate? I have absolutely no idea, but I'll, I'll, I'll answer you why you became a murderer. Okay. Go well, ahead. Fair enough. Uh, it is Go anywhere ahead. between zero to 11. So if we're looking at the kill count of God being 2.4 million, and if we look at the devil uh, as depicted in the Bible as being anywhere from zero, absolute none, nil, to 11 people, if we're just kind of stacking a weight there, if John 8.44 reads that the devil is the murderer from the beginning, and then if mm -hmm. we go down to Revelation 12, 9 through 11, the devil deceives the whole world. Now, yeah. if you think about that alone, it's kind of a plot twist at the very end of the book, right? 
Mm-hmm. You get all the way to Revelation. You're believing in this God who you have some questions about because the Old Testament's kind of weird. And then he brings in this Jesus figure and then everything kind of gets a little bit better. But to read then all the way at the end of this book that the devil deceives the whole world and not to pause there and to go, hang on, what if he deceived me in writing this book? Because at the very beginning here, I remember back in John reading that the devil's the murderer. And I've been reading about the kill count of God and it's crickets on the devil's kill count. So it's a fascinating yeah. thing when then you take the Bible and flip it on its head for all the messaging being to praise an inverted mm-hmm. deity rather than the God of light or whatever, right? Which is again, man-made. But I just yeah. find the whole thing fascinating, yeah. but please. Quite quite simply, the, the devil, Satan, whatever you want to call him, you know, he did, did deceive the world. Not that I believe in religion or anything like that. I'm just quoting from scripture and what I know of scripture. Yeah. You know, he did deceive the world in that allegedly when God created Adam and Adam's partner, Eve, <clears throat> what was the given? Everlasting yeah. life. Yeah. And what did Satan, the, the snake, wasn't anything special. It could it could have been a rabbit turning around to Adam and Eve and saying, "Eat from this fruit," you know. And and the fruit is wasn't necessarily an apple, you know. It's it's just how modern versions of the Bible have been written, you know. Eat from this fruit and you will become like God. You will know the difference between good and bad, and you will become like God, basically. So they'd been warned not to eat of this fruit from god from jehovah if you want to call him that you know and basically they um they didn't they listened to this snake which we we know was being controlled by something else which we'll call satan the devil and so because they disobeyed god's instructions the loss the lost the chance of everlasting life and of course jesus was provided allegedly to give people everlasting life again because of his sacrifice. Oh, it's so go ahead, please. Sorry. Is that no, me? I thought you were, you were, uh, you had something else to say there. My apologies. Um, it's just, it's so fascinating to think that what if, like I said, that the devil and, and really like, let's say that there is some big esoteric thing going on. Let's say just for the sake of egregores, are you, you're familiar with egregores and tulpas and the idea that you can create something out of mind and then have it interact in this physical, what we call the physical world. Are you familiar with things like that? I've never read the first description, but when you said tulpas, I, I, I do know, not a great deal, but I have heard of them. They're fairly synonymous or homunculuses in homunculi, whatever, in uh, alchemy. It's, it's, it's sort of conjuring an entity to do your bidding, right? Mm-hmm. And so let's say that maybe uh, an entity was conjured by the name of God, right? But they called it God. But maybe from the beginning, again, you know, this whole place has been deceived from the beginning to worship something. And maybe the snake was actually the true God coming in to say, hey, eat of this tree and we're going to get you out of here kind of a thing, you know, because the God, the daddy figure, this govern me harder daddy god thing was saying don't eat from that i'm going to plant it right here but don't touch it you know and maybe it was mushrooms you know what i mean that the snake said hey if you eat these <laughs> mushrooms right here dude you're gonna see god you know <laughs> and maybe this started sort of the pineal gland and this uh, jump in brains and all this all this kind of stuff i don't know but what i think is fascinating about it is just looking at the apprehension of the bible and then to look around at all the people that sit there and worship it as if it's what it's being presented as, which it's not, if you look at the idea. And so again, this inversion of reality that's been painted across everything that people are very willing to just subscribe to and never even look again from the from the two things we just saw. And I've got a list of scriptures here. Anybody can go do this in the Bible. Uh, John 8, 44, the murder, uh, devil is the murderer from the beginning. And then Revelation, 9, uh, Revelation 12, uh, 9 so through that, 11. That actual scripture that you've just quoted, John, is not incorrect if... You know what we what is written in the Bible is is completely true, right? You know, but we got to remember, you know, it's been well, you know, it's been transcribed many, many, many times, and each religion has put their little slant on it. You know, so what you've got to remember, if you know, the JWs for, and I'm not knocking them whatsoever. The, some of them are very, very nice people, you know, and people who have a religion in their lives are also nice people, you know. I, I do believe, it, as Christ is supposed to have said, "Do unto others as you would have them do to you." If everybody in the world was like that, the world would be a beautiful place. We wouldn't have wars, you know. Things that are going on in Ukraine at the moment, you know, and. 
well, it would just be a better place altogether. But we have to ask ourselves, you know, yeah, it's okay that we're inspired by God. But, well, I could say that. I've just fastened my shoelaces. Yeah, I was inspired by God to fasten my shoelaces, you know. So we, we, this is why you say to people, be informed, check everything. You know, if you can make, get yourself a copy um, of a Bible that has actually got the modern English or Romanian or Russian or Greek or whatever down one side and the old ancient languages down the other, but translated so you can read them all correctly, you know. Look up the, the words and what they mean, because people will learn a lot. Don't believe everything that you hear. There's a scripture again in the Bible, excuse me, and I can't remember where it is. could be Thessalonians 1 or 2, I can't remember, or Timothy 1 or 2, I can't remember. But it's uh, make sure of all things and hold fast to what is fine. I will say that is a JW version of it, because obviously my mum was a JW, blah, blah, blah. It's also interesting, though, um, to, you know, and then I'm, I'm going to move on from this, but I think it's uh, what I what I feel for it and the angle I come at it with with this conversation is empathy, just like you. You know, yes, we're not subscribers to the concept, but we still see a bunch of dogs out there being pump faked like the like somebody's going to throw a ball for them and they fall for it. You know what I mean? It's kind of like that. It's like we're more like, come on, dude, quit doing that and throw the ball for the dog. You know what I mean? It's It's more of a like. Quit stringing people along. You know this is a control mechanism, and it's it's not that this. It's, well, yeah, it could be a control mechanism, but what I think religion was created because. Hang on a minute. The sun came up. It went down last night. It was black. Why did it go black? Ah, it was night, but we had the moon. Man could not answer where these things came from, so they had to create some kind of. We'll call it a God with a capital G, you know, and not allegedly the son of God with a small G, you know, it's, it's, um, man couldn't answer where these things came from, how they were created, you know, why are those lights hanging up in the sky? Well, those, my friend, we now know are stars and, you know, Enrico Fermi estimated there were 300 billion stars in the galaxy, in the universe. Now, he also estimated that even if a small percentage of those stars that hang up in the sky, you know, even if a small percentage had a planet around them, that would mean somewhere from tens to tens of thousands of other planets in our, you know, universe. Now, if it can do it once here, it can do it elsewhere. And of course, I'm talking about creating life. Love it. Love it. Well, let's talk about breathing some life into a different kind of book here. The Shape of Things Who Come From Elsewhere. Tell us about this, man. That's awesome. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm sorry to uh, H.G. Wells for kind of like pinching his, uh, his title there. I thought I it did was find out you, uh, Well, I did find out you can't copyright titles, so <laughs> that's okay. Oh. Well, I mean, how could you? Like, I, I've seen a lot of books called like UFO Invasion. Yeah, you know what I mean? Exactly. You, you got it. You put exactly. your name on it, and I want to read your version of that. I love it. Yeah. Well, the, the idea of the book, as, as I, I mentioned to you slightly, you know, um, before we started, I think I did, that – you know, I, I, I come and gone from the subject, you know, life has taken over at times. And from the year, well, from when Graham Birdsell passed away, around about 20 years ago, I stepped back from the subject for a while and I decided to get reinvolved around about the end of 2013, around about 2014, that kind of time period. And I thought, well, I'm going to have to set myself aside and I'm going to have to read up on these uh, new people who've come to the subject, you know, and um, people like Jimmy Church and all the rest of them, you know, and get, get, find out what information I could about recent sightings, about how people viewed things nowadays, you know. And it was around about 2015, I thought, well, I'm going to have to get a bit more red knowledge than I've, I've got to actually carry myself through. So I started reading up on, on more and more reports. And uh, it was around about 2016, 2017, I started the magazine. So I, d I decided to read information and start putting things in the magazine. And I did that because it was more of 
well, more of myself, teaching myself different things that had been going on. I was swatting up, as we would say, over here in Britain, you know, diving in at the deep end and um, getting as much information into into the box of yeah, the old grey matter as I possibly could. So it was done. The book was, I began the book really to do that. And, you know, the book is aimed at absolutely anybody. I don't care if you've been involved three weeks and it's all new to you or you've been involved like myself 50 or more years in, in you know there is something in the book that will interest and inspire and inform you because there are plenty there's something like 65 70 different events that i've mentioned in the book it's it's a tremendous phenomena i mean what do you think about it in general what do you think about the phenomena since you started studying it to where you are now well we have to remember that when I began looking into this, it was a nuts and bolts event that we'd witnessed. You know, I, I came from, well, somebody once called me, um, I did a, another interview ooh, around about end of October last year with Paul Sinclair, actually. And um, he turned around to me, he said, bit of an old school ufologist. And I thought, well, what's an old school ufologist? Is it one that just believes in like nuts and bolts? So to some extent, I am an old school ufologist. I do believe more in the nuts and bolts theory than anything else. But that, I think, is because of the time period that I was brought up in the subject, you know, from the 70s and so on. But I'm not saying that orbs do not exist, that there are no portals or anything like that. All I'm asking for is evidence that can be proven, but proven more than once because then it becomes scientific. This is what's so interesting about the phenomena, though. It's two things. It's it's subjectivity. that the, It's it's interpreted by people differently. It's angels, demons, greys, owls, some fuck all, sometimes nothing at all. Um, and then also its ability to morph and transform in a way that it is unrepeatable. You just can't grasp a hand on it. It's, it's always out of your reach. Do you think that that's just a symptom of the phenomena or that there's something else going on with it? Well, that's, I suppose that's a $66 million question. You know, that's the, that's the winning passing the Super Bowl question, that one. You know, it's, um, I cannot give an answer to that. I'll be totally honest with you. Yes, some people, you're completely right. We had an, an incident um, of an event, a, a small village near Hull, where I live. This is going back to 1994. Two ladies will, will, will live it. We're in this house in a bungalow in a village called Sprotley. And they'd seen an orange coloured thing, I'll call it, in the sky near the house. And this thing came across uh, and eventually it, it kind of like landed in the back garden, which is what they claim. They also claim that they got some photographs of, of this thing. And um, yeah, it was orangey. I've seen the photographs. I'm going back to myself now, 1995, when I looked into this. And um, excuse me, but what they also claimed is that something got out of this this thing that landed in their garden. Now, where the, where this is, it was a, a chicken farm near the village of Sprotley. But it, by chicken farm, I, you know, it, it was processed for food and so on, and eggs and all the rest of it. Anyway, so it was a big place. Anyway, th this thing got out and it came across to the kitchen window where um, the young daughter, actually, she said she grabbed a camera, but there's a couple of versions of this. One, she says the camera was next to the window, but to other investigators, she had to run upstairs and get the camera. But I'm wondering why, but if she lives in a bungalow, it's supposed to be one level accommodation. So why is she running upstairs to get a camera? Anyway, this experience so, was so different for both of them. What they saw and how it occurred was so different for both of them. Um, there was the daughter there who at this time would be, probably be late 40s, early 50s. And the mother was there who at the time was probably late 70s, early 80s. Now, is it a generational thing? The daughter saw an alien. The mum, the mother, you guess right, she saw an angel. 
So I think it's a generational thing. I think it depends on our background. I think some of this, some, this, this phenomena, whatever it is, whatever it is controlling it, for want of a better word, I think, because if you go back to my sighting, when I shouted, look up in the sky, it's a UFO, it disappeared. Now, why did it disappear? Was it because it heard me? Was there some kind of audio device that could read my mind? Or, do you know what I'm saying? Was it the same kind of effect that these two ladies have? Does this phenomena know what we're thinking? Which I think is a, is a good question. And if I can find the answer to that, I might find the answer to my own sighting. It feels like it can. And that's that's actually the question I had for you. So do you think that in that scenario where the mom saw something different than the daughter, they had the same event, but interpreted it differently. Do you feel that it's the phenomena itself projecting itself differently to two different generations of people? Or do you think that it's in our DNA that maybe we see things differently based on our generation, which would be part two to that or part three? Uh, do you think that it's the way we interpret it simply because we can't handle what it really looks like? So our mind will just put something there because the phenomena maybe looks the same, but it's so terrifying or so beyond what we can imagine that we replace it mentally with something. And maybe this could be what screen memories are for, from is that, you know, either the occupants put that in your mind or you made it look like an owl because you couldn't handle what it really looked like, you know? So what do you think yeah. about that? Um, I would go with the first one, but with a little bit of the third one thrown in. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Yeah, that's you know you know I think it's a generational thing in that how we've been brought up as individuals you know perhaps it was might have been a little bit too much for the mum who was in the seventies eighties you know when this occurred she's no longer with us now Muriel uh, her name was Muriel Robottom Robotham or Robottom that's an adorable um, name yeah <laughs> uh, anyway she um she, she is long gone but anyway you know I think people. You know, as you get younger, you, you tend to get, you know, a little bit more free with our thoughts and all the rest of it, you know. And you, you got to think that people do change as they get older and they, they do, you know, their opinions change and life experiences change them and so on and so forth. But so I think there's a little bit of, you know, option one, as you described it, and option three thrown in. I do think if we look at the evidence from my own sighting again, there is some evidence that they know what we're thinking or what we're doing. Absolutely. You know, and I think of this whenever I think of how the phenomena has changed, how not only have the ideas come about and changed, but how people see and report and what they're seeing in the sky is like nothing. We're seeing craft that have never been described before. We're seeing all sorts of things. Now, we are seeing also balloons that people are freaking out about that are flying across and they're seeing an infrared and there's a very big difference. But there's some phenomenal shapes, some phenomenal um maneuvers being done the tic tac is very unique because we hear about these grand saucers and you know again it, you can categorize them back by decade and it seems to go through a generational shift just like we interact with the phenomena goes through a generational shift so the question then is is are they getting better at their technology are they coming out with new models all the time or is the way right. we feel about it changing meaning that we're able to comprehend them in different scopes so therefore maybe they're inviting us to participate in that and appearing that way based on their ability to read our mm. minds, as you said. In the book, uh, Shape of Things to Come from Elsewhere, one of the first sightings that I talk about is the Emperor Constantine sighting from the year 312 AD. Now, he claims he had a, a dream or a vision one evening. If you fight under this flag, or, or, or basically, I can't remember now, I ain't got the book in front of me. But, you know, I, I actually finished writing the book about 18 months ago, to be quite honest with you. Anyway, in the book, I, I describes him seeing um, a vision of a, a flag or, or, or something or other that he's told that if he fights on, under that, he will uh, win the battle, basically. Now, at the time, he was trying to become emperor of Rome. He, he was, um, he, I can't remember the name of the place. It might have been the Malvan Bridge in the year 312 AD. Now, we saw what he, he described as a cross, a flying cross. Let's come forward. 1200 AD, 
we have um, an event in Japan where a priest was supposed to be going to be beheaded because I don't know what he'd done. He'd upset the emperor in Japan, you know, um, the, 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 um, you know, they were the dominant in everything that they used to do over there, the samurais and all the rest of it. Anyway, during his execution, which I'm presuming was a daytime execution, he was going to be beheaded so people could see what was going on, punishment for disobeying, et cetera, et cetera. He witnessed a silver-like moon-shaped object. So it was either obviously circular-shaped or maybe even a crescent-shaped object, which was described as silvery. So there we see two different kind of sightings shape had changed come forward again 1967 october 1967 over the british isles in this time period october 1967 we have three days of, of sightings in various parts of the southern area of the united kingdom basically in england we have an ex ref a uh, photographic interpretation officer. I think his name was A.W. A. Brook. And he's out, he's, he retired by now, but obviously, you know, he was a professional. He knew what he was doing. He was used during the 40s and the 50s f to doing his work. So put a photograph in front of him, you know, back then he, he'd know what he was doing. Anyway, he goes for a walk one day which I think was 25th of October, uh, 1967. And he's out on the Moyne Downs, which are in uh, Dorset, which is a county of England. Moyne Downs is M-O-I-G-N-E, Moyne Downs. And he's got two dogs with him. I think one was an Alsatian and possibly the other one was a Dalmatian, but don't quote me on that. I cannot be 100% certain. Anyway, he's walking along uh, and a breeze comes up, gets a bit stronger, and, you know, he, he thinks, well, I'm, I'm going to have to get out of this wind. So he actually lays down flat on a dip in the ground. In The downs are like a series of rolling hills. So he's there, he lies down in this dip and he looks up and he sees a contrail. XREF interests him. And after a few minutes, it disappears. But it's replaced by something which comes flying down towards it, moving down towards him. It actually moves against the prevailing wind and he saw it for 22 minutes. That was a flying cross. So these shapes, they have to do change, but they keep coming round. The same things keep coming round time and time again. You know, back in the, in the, in the fifties, we had, you know, cigar shaped, at the Tic Tacs that were seen in 2004, cigar shapes. You know, these things come around. And, um, you know, the, as I say in, in the book, there's something around about 70 different sightings, which mentions many, many different different shapes altogether. Yeah, Nuremberg, 1554, that woodcut as well. A uh, yeah. bunch of stuff going on in the sky, cross-shaped UFO right there. One of the biggest, yeah. blackest things you can see, one of the biggest motherships you can identify if it's that or if it, maybe it's just really close. Fascinating stuff, man. And, um, you know, then then the question is, is then what about the TR-3B? We don't have really any triangle UFOs with four lights, you know, three on the corners and one in the middle uh, in depicted in petroglyphs and stuff if maybe we do we're just misinterpreting but what do you think about that then do you think that some of it's military craft that's copying this stuff and posing as yeah we we let's put it this way during the 1940s and let, let's go back to roswell okay oh we've seen something land or crash or something out there in the desert now the raaf um, security personnel had absolutely no idea what it was. Absolutely no idea. You know, we do know when the, you know, the U2 was being uh, developed, you know, from the skunk works, I believe it was, you know, that was often misquoted as being a UFO. So without a doubt, British military, American military, Russian military, and now, you know, with China, as it, it's, it's moving along, uh, they've all used the excuse of something being a UFO because they didn't want to give 
any advantage to their opponents in any way, shape or form. So we have to blame the government to a certain extent. We know have lied to us anyway. Oh, we have no interest in the subject. Well, hang on a minute. What about ATIP? You know, so we know they've actually lied to us over the years about these craft. Now, that doesn't mean that every single craft that has been seen, every different shape is actually government or a government and uh, military plane being developed. You know, there is a percentage of sightings and what that percentage is right now. I don't have in front of me, so I apologize, but there's a definite percentage of sightings which are unexplainable. What about the sightings that have happened under the sea, which is actually my second topic of my, my second book that I'm working on at the moment. You know, people don't see these. Usually it's it's Navy personnel or, or trawlermen or, or seamen, merchant seamen you know, who see these kind of things, you know. Where best would it be to hide something that is unexplainable if aliens were visiting the planet than in what is nearly 75% of the globe's surface? You know, we don't know what's under there. We know we know about less than 5% of what is under the ocean. You know, to be wild and crazy is to think that, like, maybe it's all aliens. Maybe there's no such thing as a government. And maybe we're just sort of being farmed and controlled and manipulated in these ways to think that we have this sort of human group of folk running us. But maybe it's not. Maybe they're just lizard turds that can sort of skinwalk or change or something. We've seen that. And then they wouldn't need to really be real extravagant about the rollout of Project Bluebeam or something, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. But then what about like that idea that it's all government craft and there's no aliens at all and they're just posing as aliens and then therefore rolling out sort of low tech versions of things to make you think that they're a lot dumber or stupider or whatever, but they're just playing this role perfectly to sort of manipulate and control just the perception management of the people. What do you think? Well, I think, you know, it's they could indeed be, as we mentioned briefly a moment ago, you know, about about various other sightings, about what people are seeing. Yes, they can. I think they can control certain things. What, the, what that is and how they do it, I do not have a clue. But at the end of the day, you know, there is something that is being witnessed by intelligent people, people in everyday walks of life, people who are supposed to be trained observers, police, Navy, Air Force personnel in all the countries around the world. These are being witnessed, you know, and not all of them are seeing something that doesn't exist. They, they are seeing something which is either one, inter, interdimensional, two, interstellar, or three, under sea. So that's that's all I'm going to say about that. Fascinating. I, and it's it's interesting, too, when you look at these craft and you think about what they can do and maybe the fact that they can do these maneuvers and everything uh, and then go from uh, water to air with no ripples of the, the disturbance of the water whatsoever, as well as then just run right into a mountain and feel like like no explosion, no nothing, no sound, anything, and it can just go through. Yeah. I've heard it described as sort of a gravity well that it creates around the craft or around this entity, whatever it is. And then that thing can basically traverse through our space as if matter doesn't matter you know yeah i understand this see this is why i, I forgive me and you know, people who are listening or watching you know i am a little bit old-fashioned in being that nuts and bolts kind of individual you know in that i believe that they are coming from elsewhere and that they are using some kind of let's go back to star trek you know they're using some kind of warp device to travel between different points whether that is you know throwing some kind of um project not a projectile that would be the wrong word i don't mean destructive projectile but kind of f firing something out from from their ship which can grab gravity or something that is that we can't see or don't understand right now they drag that towards them slip into that and come to our you know where they can they can travel like that or we seem like they're doing star trek you know where all the lights come around them and they fly past them you know i think they're using some kind of technology to get here 
you know. And as I said a short while ago with Enrico Fermi, you know, tens of thousands of planets out there. And if, like I said, if we can do it once on Earth with life, we can do it elsewhere. Oh, not we, but they can do it elsewhere. That made me sound like God then, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, shit. I mean, uh, shoe fits, man. Wear the hell out of it, you know, and kick some ass with it, you know? Um, it, it's just so interesting when you look at the phenomena, it's reach on people, the the hold it's taken over, over everybody lately, especially. I mean, even my mom's asking me about UFOs and stuff, and that's pretty wild. It's it's an interesting time to be alive, and there's a lot of changes going on. And so well, that's because of that's because of the sea change. As I mentioned a minute ago, officialdom, where you are, where I am in Great Britain, you know, they've lied to us. You know, allegedly the British closed down their UFO desk, you know, of Nick Pope and, and so on and so forth, you know, um, was 2009. We have no interest in it. But yet we know America is sh sharing information with five different nations. America, Canada, I'm not certain. I know Britain uh, is there as well, but I'm not certain of the other two right now. The sharing information from the, you know, from these uh, investig, excuse me, investigations that are going on in the Pentagon and at NASA and so on and so forth, you know. But when America would say we have no interest in the subject, not since Project Blue Book uh, stopped which actually was January 1970 and not 1969. They actually carried on receiving information up to the end of January 1970. You know, um, we've had no interest since that time date. Well, hang on a minute. You, you set up ATIP. Yeah. You know, and now you've got other organizations, but it's been a massive sea change since 17th of December 2017. Thank God for people like Ellen uh, and Ralph Blumenthal, you know, and Leslie Keane, Le Le or Kane, sorry, as, as she pronounces it. I, I'm English, we pronounce it Keane, I'm afraid. Um, okay. You know, thank God for them people who came up then and actually got the article on the front page of one of the most critical of the subject publications in the world. You know, that is a big step. And when you see newspapers like the New York Times putting that on the front page, you know, we've got a black budget kind of thing, you know, that's a big, big step for the, for the subject as a whole. So to me, people talk about wanting disclosure. Now, we've already had it. They've turned around on the 17th of December and said there is something behind this phenomena. Yes, we don't know what it is. We'll hold our hands up, but there is something behind it. Yes, it doesn't necessarily mean it's interstellar, interdimensional or anything like that. But they've had a disclosure in the fact that they've agreed that something is out there. Mm -hmm. What an interesting place this is. You know, this whole reality, this world, this realm, whatever it is, man, it's fascinating. Um, Okay, well, I'll tell you what, I've got one final question for you here before we wrap, but we are going to kick it into the afterthought, afterthought rather, uh, that if you guys would like to join us for and check that out, as well as come join us for the Hangouts, you can check the link below. Come come hang out. It's It's been an awesome time, and uh, Polymath Jenny over here is creating amazing art that we will probably see finished up in the second part of our show here, but you'll uh, check the link below and uh, join us for that. And Jenny, I just want to thank you so much for hanging out. This was absolutely amazing. Cheers. Your hands look brilliant. I know. Gosh, <laughs> it's so cool. All right, so come see the, the finished piece in the after hours here, and as well as I'm going to link it down below. Wow. Hang on. Wow. How cool That's is neat. that? The cute clouds up there. God, look at the 3D on the sign. New flesh. Oh, my God, how cool. Wow. Well, uh, for you audio only audience, check the video uh, link in the show description down there so you can check this out and absolutely watch her create this amazingly beautiful thing along with this. All right, my friend. So, Chris, um, all the ways to find you, my friend, are going to be located down below your book, your website, everything, Outer Limits Magazine. You guys definitely check out the book, The Shape of Things to Come from Elsewhere. Chris Ivers, leave us on a high note, brother. What gets you out of bed every single morning going, you know what? I'm going to put these pants on one leg at a time and do it with a smile and keep moving. What do you think? Getting the pants on is okay. It's getting my socks on. That's the problem. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Um, the thing that gets me out of bed every day is that I'm currently planning a, a conference in the Hull area uh, for September this year. That's the 14th of September at the Hull University. 
Kingston upon Hull University. Uh, that's on Cottingham Road in Hull. Uh, Peter Robbins is coming over from the US of A. And we've got uh, several British speakers who, who are attending as well. The names which probably won't mean anything to you, but people like Jason Gleaves, Graham Rendell. Um, I'm speaking a little bit about, you know, well, I'm a host anyway, so I've got to speak, you know. But um, yeah, and a couple of others more. And if I've, I've missed your name, once again, ladies and gentlemen, I, I apologise. But um that kind of gets me up because I've got things to do with that, selling tickets and so on. I'm working on my second book on the subject. Um, USOs, question mark, all at sea. So I'm working on that one right now. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm making the next uh, magazine, which goes out on the, uh, let me think, it's April. It goes out, the next one goes out in April, 1st of April. So them kind of things get me up. But the most important thing is I'm married. I've been with my wife, Jan, you know, for... Um, 28 years nearly now and um, you know it's Valentine's Day so I, I had to smile a little no I'm only joking she's absolutely fine so I am my wife's carer so I do a little bit of breakfast for my wife in the morning and all that kind of stuff so just life in general you know we're only here the once so make the most of it Massive thanks to Chris Evers. Amazing for coming by and hanging out. What a cool conversation. If you guys would like to check out uh, the Afterthoughts, that's hosted over on Patreon. So there's actually more of this conversation to enjoy. You can get access to that, all of the bonus content as well with the correct tier over there. So make sure you're reading carefully. You can join us for the Hangouts that we're doing very weekly on this, more than several a month, and they are a blast. You can catch the replays over there, but if you'd like to join us for those in person and come hang out, love to see you there. Now, down there, along with all the ways to find Chris Evers and Polymath Jenny, thank you so much for that amazing, fucking beautiful piece of art you created with us there. Uh, you will find the link that reads expandingrealitypodcast.com, and that is going to give you access to all things us as well. That is where all of our publications through Redigital Publishing are being hosted. We have all of our journals up on both platforms, KDP or Amazon, uh, as well as Barnes & Noble. So you guys go check those things out. Tons of cool contributions. Uh, Polymath Jenny has actually contributed in one of those creative expansion journals that we have up available over there. So check those links, guys. Uh, the event, the Befriending Bigfoot event, May 15th through the 20th. It's going off. We have so many cool fucking things going on. Check the link down there to join us for that. And I cannot wait to see you all there. Now, before I let you run here, I just want to remind you that you are all beautiful and fucking amazing and perfect in every way. And yeah, if that triggers you, enjoy it. You are perfect. Keep evolving. Keep moving forward. Keep asking questions. You're fucking beautiful. While you're along that journey, maybe, you know, get out of the left-hand lane. Maybe scoop up a little piece of trash you see blowing around on the ground. You're like, ah, oh, that's dumb. I'm going to pick it up and throw it away. That's beautiful, okay? Uh, another thing, too, that would be just to go out into this beautifully mysterious and fucking weird place sometimes, just whatever it is, and... Be good to one another, you know? That's it. Be good to fucking one another, man. Love you all from the bottom of my heart. Hope to see you at the event, but either way, I love you. We'll see you next time. The haunting legends of a mighty Bigfoot have made man's blood run cold for centuries. Some terrific and some terrifying. The Southern Appalachian Mountains whisper the mysteries of this strange and powerful creature through its smoky hills and ominous embrace. This is Brandon Thomas with Expanding Reality, elated to announce our very first Expanding Reality Excursions Befriending Bigfoot event. This is going to take place on a beautiful 27-acre ranch in Blairsville, Georgia, May 15th through the 20th. This intimate conference is going to feature Bigfoot adventure hikes in three different states, river kayaking, nightly presentations from such incredible presenters as Alexander Petikoff, Chris Matthew, Dave Zed, Preston Dennett, and many more. Also, we're going to be doing some UFO watching, some jam sessions, all kinds of hangouts. Visit expandingrealitypodcast.com slash events for more information. That's expandingrealitypodcast.com slash events. We'll see you there.